Hi, I'm Jimmy Barnes. Life in the music business can bring a lot of glamour and a lot of success, and sometimes dark moments and hard times. Tonight's program is about an old mate of mine who's experienced both extremes. Rick Grossman was in the Divinals when he went completely off the rails before recovering and joining the Hoodoo Gurus. Now he wants to give something back with the help of some famous faces. This is his Australian story. <laughs> John, how are you? Good, mate. Good to see you. Yeah. I can actually say that I, I've managed to do something that I love all my life. I make a living out of something that I love, and you can't really ask for more than that. If we're running ahead, you know, like, too long, we can get rid of former surfers. <laughs> The last 20 years, uh, being part of the Hoodoo Gurus, it's a bit of a dream come true, really. I, I, you know, I was given my life back in a, in a lot of ways. I feel lucky that I didn't lose my life, and I feel privileged to be asked by great musicians to play with them. The best live band in Australia, the Hoodoo Gurus. He was a pop star, pretty much, before, <laughs> before you know, I really got a start. He was already a kind of a celebrity of sorts. You know, the Divinals were having a good run at the time, you know, with boys in town, etc. As a bass player, he was regarded as peerless, really, and bought solid rock and roll bass guitar playing. Come any time, I won't give you pressure. Come any time. Rick was gorgeous. He had great legs. Once Rick came into the band, everything just came together because of his style and his sound and his energy, and it just was a really good fit. And we've gone through huge things together, life crises. We've always been there for each other. I love the Divines with all my heart. To be in a band that I love, with people that I love, playing great original music, Australian music, being on tour in America. And I remember being in a hotel room in New York and I'm looking out over New York City and I'm thinking, wow, you know, that 14 year old kid used to dream about this. And I actually didn't start weeping or anything, but I started to cry to myself. It was like it was happening to someone else. I couldn't experience what was happening to me. I was dead inside. I believe that that's what addiction does. And I was lucky that I still had enough left. Enough of that little flame of what you call the human spirit to want to do something about it. I started playing bass guitar when I first went to Sydney High, mainly because a guy in my class who was a guitar player told me that I meet a lot of girls if I play in a band. And the thing that changed my life, I guess, was uh, when I uh, saw Led Zeppelin. They came out here in 1972 and uh, it was the first big concert I'd ever seen. I walked out of that concert a changed person and I just knew that that's what I wanted to do. The end of 1980, uh, I got a gig with a great band called Matt Finish. We were um, taken out into the suburbs on tour by the groups that were really popular, Midnight Oil, The Angels, Cold Chisel. 
and fed to the wolves, so to speak, to these <laughs> suburban audiences. And uh, it was fantastic. It was terrifying, but it was fantastic. It's a fine line between pleasure and pain. You've done it once, you can do it again. In 1982, I was approached to join the Divinals. I just love their singer, Chrissy. At the time, female singers were kind of pretty demure. There weren't really any female rock and roll singers around. And out she came. She was just something else, you know. She, she uh, terrified the audience. There's something about seeing this beautiful woman kind of snarling and leaping into the audience and throwing punches at people and, that, that appealed to me. Musically, there was definitely a fit, but also as this gang that we became, I think, because we had an orphan mentality, I think. And so we all, we were a gang, and we stuck together as a gang because it was us against the world. There's a lot of drugs, speed, it was rife in the music industry then. In the 80s, it was kind of the social thing to do cocaine. Heroin had started to appear, but I distinctly remember the first time I used it, that feeling of just complete and utter euphoria. I think if you're a musician in the late 70s and 80s in Australia, in the big cities, it would have been easy to get pretty much anything you wanted. Not just drugs, but... It was all available. A lot of recreational drugs. The Divinals were one of the first Australian bands to sign direct to a US record company. And uh, before we knew it, we were in New York making an album, which was an amazing experience. We go to the studio, you bump into, you know, Diana Ross or Bruce Springsteen at the coffee machine. When an Australian band first, first hits America, I think um, the drugs are cheaper than Australia and better. So you've got to try them. So, uh, and in the 80s in America, it was just everywhere and part of the culture. My friends, my social scene in Sydney were all using heroin. The nature of addiction is very insidious. Just slowly, insidiously, started using it a bit more and a bit more. Before I knew it, I would physically have to have it. Then it just became years of being on this treadmill. I know that uh, I use drugs for escape, basically escape from myself. I didn't particularly feel comfortable in myself due to a couple of things that happened in my family when I was very young. Maybe a parent leaving. There was a lot of shame about what I was doing and so I kept it very quiet. We've been friends for a long time. There were a couple of occasions that Rick asked me for some money and I thought, hang on, I'm, he's playing in some good bands, you know, I mean, they were, they were getting a good wage and they were successful bands. So I was thinking, he doesn't really need the money, so... But I still didn't put two and two together. Maybe I didn't want to. I wasn't aware what he was doing. And he and I used to have martinis at 10am in the morning at airports, waiting for aeroplanes. Drinking was my primary problem. But I wasn't aware of his heavier drug taking. I didn't know. So I'd got onto this spiral that to my own amazement, I could not stop no matter what was happening. You know, I was lucky that uh, I didn't actually have to resort to any sort of crime. I've no doubt that if I'd continued down the path, I would have started to look at things like that because I certainly started doing things that I vowed I would never do. There was one particular time where I'd been waiting 
for four or five hours for someone to turn up to give me some smack. And they arrived and uh, gave it to me and I ran into the bathroom in my apartment and accidentally dropped it into the toilet. And, uh, you know, I didn't cry when my dad died. And I was in tears when I did that. I watched Rick become shyer and more withdrawn and um, without a voice. I just thought it was because he was losing interest in the band, so I blamed myself. We'd been on the road for quite a few weeks, we'd come to the end of an Australian tour and um, went out to a suburban hotel to play and I had used this stuff, felt terrific. Got on stage, felt unreal. And um, I was playing and I looked down and there was a trickle of blood coming out of my arm. I was uh, absolutely shattered. And uh, no one else saw it, I saw it. And, uh, and it was like just this moment where you're revealed to yourself. And I remember thinking, well, here's something I've loved so passionately to do, play music. And I have to stick a needle in my arm each day just to feel or get some sort of semblance of self, feel OK in my skin. And uh, it's something's got to change. And I said to them, I need some time off. They asked me what was wrong, I said, I have a health problem. What sort of health problem was it? I don't really want to say. You know, we were very, we were very close. We were all living together, we were busing together. So we, we were a family. So this was a shock, I couldn't believe it. They said, you have to tell us what's wrong. And I said, I'm a f***ing heroin addict, OK? And I'll never forget their, uh, the look. I mean, Mark uh, McEntee, our guitar player, so just a fantastic musician started crying. We didn't want him to leave the band. I mean, we were crying. You know, please don't go. But he had to go away and do what he had to do to fix up his life. I went to a couple of detox centres. It was a pretty horrific experience coming off the drugs. Lots of sweats and no sleep for a week. But I guess the physical side of coming off it was the easy part. It was recommended to me that it might be beneficial if I go to a place called the Buttery, which is up in uh, northern New South Wales, a drug rehabilitation centre inland from Byron Bay. And I can distinctly remember being on the bus thinking, this is going to be like jail. I knew that this was kind of a momentous thing that was ahead of me. At that stage, I think Rick was still caught up in the fact that he was a member of the Divinals and that he'd met a lot of famous people. He had his, this sense of who he was coming in here. And uh, at the time Rick was here, we did have one uh, counsellor who uh, had, a, had a way of being fairly direct. And he really uh, said a couple of home truths to me that made me realise where I was. I was in a drug rehab. And uh, this was a matter of life or death, pretty much. Five days later, I got a call from the manager of the Divinals, who said to me, Mark and Chrissy, send their love to you. We're all thinking about you. And we just want you to know that we found someone to replace you in the band. And we just want to wish you all the best. Very kind. It wasn't nasty message at all. It was quite the opposite. All really good intentions, but I, uh, I was devastated. So, Seto, would you mind starting off reading just about assertiveness? Assertive people are usually relaxed and easygoing, but are honest about their feelings, including anger. And I really thought that my life was finished. One of the counsellors there sat me down and said, well, maybe it might be good to look at it a different way and maybe this is the beginning of your life. Upsetting people. Yeah. So you disconnect from people, you're upset with mm. them. 
There is a very strong sense of community that we work very hard to engender or create here. People do live in four separate households, so to all intents and purposes they're operating as an extended family and gradually they take on increasing levels of responsibility. I spent five months. When I left, I felt I was absolutely drug free and I've been so for six months. Extend both legs out in front. So this time the left knee's on top. I'd been doing meditation and yoga and all sorts of stuff there. It was, I felt fantastic. The buttery acts as a kind of cocoon, an umbrella, a sanctuary. In more ways than one, I think the buttery saved Rick's life. He was a completely different person. He looked fit. He'd gained weight. He was more than ready to start playing again. He was eager to, to, get, to get out on stage and, and do what Rick does best, which is tread the boards with a, with a rock band. In 1988, the Hoodoo Gurus lost our old bass player. Our singer Dave Faulkner asked an old mate of ours, Charles Fisher, who was a record producer and had produced our second album, said, you know, what are we going to do? We need a bass player. Quick scene. Yeah. And Charles, right up front, just said, for rock and roll bass playing in Australia, you can't go past Rick Grossman. To which we replied, isn't he a dirty junkie? You don't know definitively, but he certainly had a reputation as having had some issues with heroin that kind of freaked us out. I understood their concerns, you know, I just had to kind of let it be, you know, and just give them my side and just say, well, look, I've been addressing this issue and, uh, yeah, hopefully, um, I'm, you know, I won't go back there. But we got to the point where he came down and auditioned and it was just, you know, like, hallelujah. It, it felt so completely natural and organic to have him there. It was amazing getting an offer from the gurus and uh, being a part of a band for 20 years that, uh, to me, just keeps getting better is due to recovery, because I know with no reservation that if I hadn't gone to recovery, I would have none of that in my life. Over the years, I've kept my uh, contact up with the buttery. I really believe in the place as a facility, but also I love going back there to see where I've come from. A few years ago, they asked me to get involved with the buttery on an official capacity as a fundraiser. So yeah, now that the uh, waters are back and the lilies are out, it's sort of, when they start to flower, it'll be beautiful in here. As it stands now, the buttery takes 28 people. It's a five month waiting list, at least, to get in. We're going to put the Therapeutic Community Main Building sort of basically along here. The down. wish of the buttery is to the double the size by building a new facility on the land that they own. And unfortunately, it takes a lot of money to do that. And they'll sort of look individually like that. That's the grand design. It's crazy in the sense that while someone's waiting to gain admission here, they're at risk of um, dying, basically, of overdosing or um, using some drugs that compromises their health. Oh, Barry. Barry and I came up with this idea of a fundraising CD. Due to the fact that I've been in the music industry for a long time, I uh, obviously know a lot of people, and uh, basically I just started asking the songs. First person I contacted was Neil Finn. I actually sent Neil an email telling him what it was like to arrive at the buttery. And two days later, I received an email back from him with an attachment, which was uh, a song, and he said, uh, I hope this helps. This adventure has left me reeling. I know that he went through um, and got a lot of help from the buttery at the time. I admire anybody who looks inside themselves and figures out what their worst demons are and beats them. 
Somewhere there's a guiding star Somewhere there's a safe retreat Close your eyes and there you are With somewhere there is sanctuary We can find some peace The lyrics of the song hit home for me and uh well, I, I brought the song up to the buttery and we played the song to the residents and uh, certainly had a profound effect. At the end of the day, if it finds a home and it can help a few people, or help the buttery help a few people, then it's, um, it's a good feeling as a songwriter. You, you want to be useful. <laughs> I hurt myself today To see if I still feel Part of the program at the buttery is uh, choir very therapeutic to sing. It was agreed that it would be great to have some sort of actual participation from the residents on the record. So uh, we had picked this song that Jimmy Barnes was going to sing. It's the song sort of actually written about addiction. It's a song called Hurt. What have I become? My sweetest friend. All the people in this room know that recovery is an ongoing thing a day at a time and uh, if you drop your guard, you are quite liable to relapse and that's what happened to me in 1990. And it was all due to some emotional things that were happening in my life that I hadn't really taken care of. My empire of dirt. And I thought maybe I could get away with medicating myself again. And I tried it a couple of times and it was a nightmare. It's horrible. If I, could start again. I knew he had problems. Rick and I were always mates, but you know, we seemed to sort of drift in and out of each other's paths all the time, mainly because we were taking different sorts of drugs. <laughs> Anybody can detox. It's to stay off it is the hard thing. I drink a lot and take drugs, acid and speed. And, so eventually, you know, um, when I did decide to get clean, Rick was one of the main people that sort of, you know, helped me. And I just thought, this guy's incredible, and this is exactly why I wanted to be involved in this project and this record for Rick. The needle tears a hole The old familiar stain I spoke to this old bloke who'd been sober 30 years. And he said, well, mate, you can leave all of that stuff if you want. But the problem's you. What have I become? And uh, that was uh, an amazing moment. The problem was me. I had to stand up and face this thing and make a decision. Am I going to stay clean or not? That was the turning point for me. Since 1990, I haven't had to uh, have a drink or stick a needle in my arm, snort anything or do any, any of this sort of stuff, you know, which is a miracle. Because it was just way down. Rick got straight and sober long before me. When I get back from my rehab centre stint, there was nobody who else understood what I was going through except for Rick, and that's when, you know, Rick would knock on my door every single night of the week. He'd call me four times a day and just say, Are you okay? Do you want a coffee? Do you want to talk? And I wasn't the only person he was doing it for. He was doing it for a lot of different people at the same time. Uh, you know, because people would go to detox and they'd say, I'm going to give up everything and change my life. And they'd say, well, <laughs> yeah, maybe you don't give up smoking yet, you know. From 1998, I actually started working on the other side as a counsellor. Uh, I'm genuinely interested in addiction and I love seeing people change and uh, get better. But I felt that because of my experience that I had something to offer. And I, I just got this uh, ability to laugh when I got clean. Yeah. Which, was, which had been missing for quite a few years. You know? like, that's the bit that gets me, because I'm not good at, at all those things. I'm a junkie, and um, 
I'm getting to actually live through those things mm. and I value that. Rick is a success story and a survivor. And like a lot of survivors, he's more than ably equipped to go and help others. You'd always be suspicious about people counselling if, if they actually hadn't seen the dark side or at least gone to the edge of the precipice. And Rick de did and he's come out the other end. Yeah, so without, without somebody here all the time, it you know, falls into disrepair as you can see. And things the cause, out. which is to build a new battery to increase our capacity, is his way of giving back to people in the future. You know, not just to the people who are on our waiting list today, but there will be people in the future who he will help by making this possible. And he wants to provide an opportunity for other people um, to get into recovery and to regain their life as he has. The buttery uh, for me not only saved my life, it, it changed my life uh, dramatically and it planted the seed of what would be possible. These days, the gurus, you know, we're always playing. We love playing and uh, we still love this racket that we make when we get together. And uh, I don't think I'll ever stop. Very moving.